And then it was adopted as the M9 service pistol, which is the M92. Yeah, and they made uh, a few changes. Like, what what's the difference between an M9 and the M92? What is up, everybody? Jim to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern, across from me. Well, excuse me, across from Jim and I right now. A uh, couple questions for the uh, for the listeners out there. Do you like '80s action movies? Mm. Do you like military firearms of historical significance? Mm. Do you like sleek Italian lines? If your answers to those questions are yes, then you're probably going to like the Beretta M9. Yep. That's what we have in front of us. Jim, you've, uh, you've brought the, well, I brought the, uh, the old bull. You brought the young calf <laughs> as it relates to, uh, <laughs> Ryan, is everything okay over there? Uh the intros get him every time. I do you know? Do you know that I do those for him? That's good. I it's I can tell to, that he really enjoys it. It made his day. It's my gift. It made to you. my day too, Mark. It's it's t- it just takes a great deal of practice to be able to make it through your intros without just beaming. Thank you. I lo- I lost my gourd when you said that last bit. The the intro the intro Mark was brilliant, and then I brought the old bull. <laughs> <laughs> It is true. I it's can't. true. We got a couple. I mean, this thing is, uh, it's not a new firearm. No. It's Mm-mm. a child of the 70s. Flower child. Or was that the 60s? I think that's the 60s. Okay. And then you have, I mean, just this newfangled that obviously carries over a lot of the elements of the original, mm-hmm. but it's yeah. got, it's, uh, it's all fancied up. I cannot claim the young calf that belongs to Brennan down at the range. We're borrowing it. Yeah. I just brought it. But it's fitting. For today's episode, we've done a couple of episodes on on interesting firearms, and some of them seem to have been by request. Some of them are just by our own uh, in- enthusiasm. Yeah. And this one, though, uh, like you said, has been around so long. It's been iterated upon, like we see with the newer model there, Brennan's gun. But even just the old original is quite a nice firearm. It mm. really is, but it, it gets a lot of a flack. Oh yeah, it's uh okay. So yes, it does get some flack. But then, why the heck did we use it? For, look, let's talk some history here before sure. we get into flack. Let's uh, Ryan uh, give us a little rundown. I've got a couple notes here as well. You have to day check me because this is. Excuse me, I coughed. Th- that's okay. Do you, you know what would make. That better is if you had your water bottle. I forgot that. Oh, Jim brought his. I brought mine. Uh, cool drink flex. I uh, know you hate it when my drink is on the table. You've never said anything of Jim. Anyway, I think the year was 1975. I find the coffee cup cluttery. It's distracting. Oh, that's great, Mark. Yeah, but the dirty smoke-colored Nalgene with a bright orange very lid lanyard is Jesus. not. Very so. outdoors. Sure, sure. I think it was 1975. 75? I think so. Okay. Their boots. Their boots. Yeah. Uh, the Beretta M92 hatched onto the scene. Okay. Yeah, right. which which is an adaptation of some um, previous Beretta pistols that if you look back into uh, the Beretta lineage, a lot of those lines that you talk about, those sleek Italian lines, mm-hmm. um, the controls, the, the very famous slide profile with a very exposed barrel, mm-hmm. all comes through. Um, enter the M92. And then sometime in the 80s, I'm going to say 1982? I think 85. 85? Well, it depends on what you're talking about. Uh, adoption of the United States military. I think that was 85. Okay, could be. It was before my I'm time. Look it up. Mark's got notes. Hold on. Uh, this, this is from the Beretta website. This legendary semi-auto handgun has not only won the historic contract with the U.S. military in 1985. 85. Mark. But has achieved a triumphant contract renewal. And so forth. Sure. Way to go on the printouts. Nice job. They're highlighted too. Yeah. Wow. You did pre work. Uh, and then it was adopted as the M9 service pistol, which is the M92. Yeah. And they made uh, a few changes. Like, what? what's the difference between an M9 and the M92? Uh, depends on where you were in its okay. history. Yeah. So if we look at them now, they have their safety up here on the slide, underneath the rear side assembly that also functions as a decocker. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, they were frame-mounted 
right here. Not unlike uh, 1911. Which seems preferable. I don't know. I, I know that a lot of a lot of the flack that the OM9 gets is this slide mounted safety and it's it's not exactly the easiest thing to just flick with your thumb I will say uh, it requires a bit of a uh, you have large hands I have small hands I don't know if that's true Paul Nee says large hands well okay you just named a person of many who has large hands but I just <laughs> I feel like it need I need to like dislocate my thumb slightly to get it up there like I can't maintain. I suppose if you're going, well, no, if you're going off safe, though. Wait, which way is off safe and which way is on safe? Like, on safe? I, I already forget. Off safe. Oh, yeah, I don't like that. It should be, don't you think it should be sweeping down instead of pushing up? I mean, that is more convenient. You're correct. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, they went from frame mounted to slide mounted. Uh, that did for a long time complicate the mounting of any red dot adapter on top of this pistol. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until fairly recently that that egg was cracked. Um, on the gun. Yeah. So now we can mount conventional red dots using a clever adapter plates on top of these. I did one in the shop the other day. Is it you, still... Uh, I thought I was reading that it's still, like, not the most ideal platform. E- even in, like, you know, you're talking about the modern one, which, you know, Brennan's does have a red dot on it right now. Um, is it is it harder in any way, or it's just... it's No. No? Okay. No. I mean, so if we're going to take this pistol, this this 92, um, and put a dot on it, we're going to be using a diving board style mount that we're knocking the rear sight out. We're putting a, a plate adapter in place here. Okay. We have a pretty tall height over bore um, with the dot. It's it's not terrible. Uh, but the presentation is a bit odd. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's the case with pretty much any semi-automatic pistol that you're knocking the rear sight out and putting a, a dovetail adapter in. Um, Beretta now makes a pistol that is optics ready in the, the M992 family. Okay. Um, and that's using a plate matrix, not unlike a lot of these other pistol companies that are allowing you to put red dots mm-hmm. on them. Um, some challenges or shortcomings I've heard people say is if you look at the slide profile, oh, this pistol's unloaded. If you look at the, I don't know which camera to point at, the slide profile, it, it's got like a very narrow little hump on top as opposed to think like a Glock is like a sure one by one square. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the current models that accept uh, a dot on there, like that line is still there. There's a cutout, the plate goes on there and the plate kind of is proud over the lines of the pistol. And some people say it's unsightly, but be that as it may, it's functional. Uh, So you can certainly do that with really little trouble. Um, you wouldn't be able to easily adapt a non-optics ready variant like this to being optics ready in that form or fashion. Not talking about a dovetail mount, that would be difficult, right? Oh yeah, that's a a fair amount of machine work. Yeah, okay. and and some concessions. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's doable. I just like that it's a factory option now, plug and play. Yeah, they caught up with modern times. They're a few about a decade behind. Most everybody else, but yeah, um, you know how I am. I can't shoot a red dot on a pistol anyway, so that doesn't make any, you. It's go, a me. It's a me go thing. Go to a Vortex Edge class. It's a me thing. Go to. It's that's not a you, you thing. That's it's you not being a you thing. You're stuck giving in your up. ways. You're giving up. You're stuck in your ways. I don't have a pistol that can take a red dot. Why don't you? It's, it's so I, simple now. They almost all do. You know how Mark hates 1911s. That's me. I'm just trying to mix it up. Mark hates AR. He's deflecting. No, you hate it, Mark. It, Mark hates M1 Grands. That's not true at all. That was also me. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's a me thing. I don't It's not. It's just, well, yeah, it's a you thing, but it's not just that you can't. It's just that I don't. Yeah. For no good reason, other than none of my pistols. You're a chump. That's correct. While you're holding it to the camera that direction, they might be able to see the, uh, the open top and the massive... Ejection port. Big ground. Essentially. Yeah. Um pretty unique. Yes? Oh yeah. I mean you look at a lot of other pistols, all of that's enclosed. And so your barrel hood is the only thing that's exposed. And then your your reciprocation opens up just enough to more or less take up the space that the barrel hood did. And then upon closure, your barrel hood indexes back up. 
this isn't something that they did to save money or cut costs. No, it's kind of always takes more machine work. I would, I would say, yeah. to make that feature. What did they do it to lighten the slide so it has less reciprocate, like less, less mass going forward and back, or a is theory. that part of what makes it so smooth shooting? Is our very smooth shooting firearm? They are. Uh, I think that's a theory. They've got a pretty beefy frame. It's an all alloy frame, mm-hmm. um, and a fairly light slide. So in comparison, you look at the. M9, M92, M96, whatever variant you want, uh, it's always open top, right? So there's not a lot of material up here. Less reciprocating mass coming back, I think that's definitely lends to their kind of inherent shootability. Uh, and whether it was a cheetah, which is another pistol that they make that looks like this, it's just smaller, mm-hmm. or um, you know a 96, which is the 40 caliber version it's of this. 96. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are very pleasant pistols to shoot. And yeah, I surmise you're absolutely correct. With the lower reciprocating mass, you're going to have a more pleasant pistol to shoot. They're also very ergonomic. Like when you hold them in the hand, they fit the hand very well. They Whether do. you have large or small hands, they kind of meld to the human hand well. They point very instinctively and intuitively. And their layout is quite nice. Mm-hmm. They, they, they catch a kind of a ration of crap from a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I've heard a lot of folks that have used these in like the military that talk about some inherent reliability issues, frame cracking, slide cracking, um, incursion of debris into that very open top slide, Mm -hmm. um, creating problems. That could be true. Uh, The frame cracking and the slide cracking thing, I think, has been definitely addressed. I feel like that was like very early on from what I was looking at, at least. Yeah, and... And I, I really don't know anybody. I had one customer way back in the day that said when he was um, deployed with it, his pistol did do that. Uh, and it was shredded when he was issued it, and he got a fairly new one. Oh, pre-shredded, like yeah. most firearms yeah. issued to uh, soldiers are. His, he said his barrel was completely silver, which they didn't come that way. So... <laughs> Probably due to the uh, cleaning practices. Cleaning practices, constant reholstering, exposure to you know fine sand and particulate things yeah. like that. Um. Oh, what was I going to? One thing. Okay, one thing about the barrel that I got to ask. So I I actually used to think that this was a fixed barrel gun. Sure. By the way that the barrel looks when you when you pull the slide back, mm-hmm. because when you pull the slide back on like a Glock or a Smith and Wesson, any one of these polymer frame, yeah it kind of cantilevers up as you pull the slide back, uh, whereas this stays flat Fairly, and, yep. and straight. Uh, so that's why I actually I thought it was a fixed barrel gun, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not. Correct. So can you explain the differences in, like, pistol actions between, like, what's going on with a Glock, what's going on with something like, uh, isn't like the Walther PPK? Walther PP or, or P230, 232. Sure, so those are fixed barrel fixed, guns. Yep, fixed, breech, or fixed barrel guns, yep. And then, like, what's going on between these different pistols? Sure. So I don't have a Glock on the table, and I don't have a fixed barrel gun on the table, uh, but we do have some Berettas on the table. And so you'll see this little hinge mechanism here. There's your drop. That's what you're getting, right? Okay. Mm. So this is this is think of think of the Glock barrel. Underneath the barrel hood is the we'll call it a linkage attachment that the recoil spring and guide rod hook into and then the feed ramp is attached to Mm -hmm. because that part is fixed the whole barrel boop drops out of the way and then comes back into battery when the slide re-indexes and it does that so that it can pick up that next round it tilts the feed ramp into the proper geometry to pick up the next round right correct that's what it's doing yep okay this is the linkage that moves Hmm. instead of the whole barrel so the barrel the barrel stays fairly static in position like this moves like this hmm during the, the recoil, like firing, uh, ejecting, pickup, and re-battery sequence. This is the part that articulates, as opposed to the whole barrel dropping down. Interesting. Where you mentioned like the Walther PP series pistols, or, or like a Sig P230, um, some of the Glocks that you can't get in the United States that are chambered in 380. That fixed barrel design, the barrel is stuck to the frame. Like right. If you were to take and deslide the pistol you would end up with something that looked like this. Right. Where there's typically a recoil spring assembly that goes around the barrel, Hmm. like on the um, Walther's, a Bursa Thunder, things like that. The barrel stays in place. You fire the weapon, barrel's fixed, slide reciprocates and picks it up. Curiously, a lot of recoil on those. 
I carried a SIG P230 and a P232 for a number of years, brilliant pistols. They were a handful to shoot. They were a small gun, but they were ergonomic, mm. and their recoil class seemed way higher than a 380 would normally generate. Like, you shoot, you like, ow, kind of hurt. Mm. Um, that that uh, dropping of the, of the breech and barrel assembly or, or the reciprocation of the barrel in this case takes out a lot of that recoil Soaks impulse. up a lot of energy. Yeah, yeah. a considerable amount. Um, those fixed breech guns are kind of snappy inherently. Uh, but it is it is a clever design. It is fairly unique unto the Beretta M9 design and its clones and variants, of which there are many. Uh, but a very clever pistol. And there I really are some clones, aren't there? I I remember. Oh yeah, Taurus has one. PT 92s, PT 100s, uh, whole pile of them. Yeah. Yep. Whole pile of them. If you're watching on YouTube a second ago, I'd like to point out, and or you may have noticed, uh, the ease and expeditious nature of which you uh, field, that strip, fire, that, field strip yeah. that firearm, got it all yeah. the, all the parts and pieces out, um, which is I'd, I'd say noteworthy. Yes. For this firearm, I think um, if anybody's ever seen the hit movie film Rush Hour. Okay. One, two, or three. You watch Jackie Chan yeah, snatch a Beretta and take it apart in the guy's hand. You can do that with that. You know, that's not just movie magic. No, it's Jackie Chan, firearms expert. Yeah, Jackie Chan didn't rely on no magic. No, if he doesn't believe in the thing, he's a, he's a professional. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're pretty easy to take apart. Really, really easy gun to service. Um, and I... I quite like them for that. Like you look at the the trigger pack and everything's fairly robust and fairly enclosed and yeah. there's not a lot of pins that are holding things in place. There's less um there's less little tiny things going on than w- what I would expect what I see inside of a Glock or a, a polymer frame gun. Yep. yep. Uh because you don't have that big trigger bar linkage thing going backward. Mm-hmm. Um it looks very simple. And they are, and robust. And their feed rails are one, two, three, four, five, six. Beefy. Yep. There's a lot of material there. Um, how, did you, how did you do that takedown? Can you do that again real quick? Well, sure. You put it together. Gun is together. Okay. So on the right side of the frame, there's a large button. Yeah. And it's more button-shaped than a lot of buttons on firearms today. So it's oval-shaped right here. Mm-hmm. Push that on the opposing side of the frame. There's a lever. It will sweep down. I'm sweeping up because I have the gun inverted. Mm-hmm. That <laughs> unlocks the slide lock assembly, and the slide simply Didn't comes off. Didn't even need off. to pull the trigger. No. Nope. So very, very easy gun to That's manipulate. fantastic. Yeah. And that's why Jackie Chan was able to do that. Because uh, <laughs> he just gah, grabbed it, and the whole thing comes apart. And I don't see that as a flaw. I think that's a, a novel thing. They're very easy pistol to service. Um, triggers are very good. They're a, a double action, single action with a decocker, mm-hmm. which I really like. So in single can action, you, I want. Can you talk about the double single? Yeah. So the pistol can be fired in double action only. So I can pull the trigger as many times as mm-hmm. I want. Uh, think of it like a revolver, right? Like a, a Smith Wesson J frame mm-hmm. or something like that. The pistol can also be after firing it or cocking it manually, fired in single action mode, in which the trigger take up has been Cut in half. Um, we have a small amount of take up, firm back wall, trigger fires in single action mode. Slide would reciprocate. We're back into single action mode. And then it also has a sweeping decock. So right now the condition of the pistol, if it was loaded, is hammer back, safety off, ready to fire in single action. If the user wanted to bring this pistol back to a safe condition, a sweep down of the selector will decock the pistol. It's going to drop the hammer but it's going to put a uh, barrier between the hammer itself and then the firing pin, and it's going to bring the hammer down to the you know closed or at-rest position. The safety is now on. This pistol is inoperable mm-hmm. in this regard. The safety can then be swept forward. The pistol is on fire but in double action mode, so it's going to take probably triple the force mm-hmm. and travel to get it to fire. To the unknowing eye, that decock is a bit... Um 
unnerving. Unnerving. Oh yes. yeah, because that thing goes forward and makes a click sound. I mean, yeah, there's other decockers that kind of like ease the hammer forward, mm-hmm. but like you said, I, if you actually watch from behind, you can see that barrier as you push that sweeping decocker down. You can see the barrier coming up, blocking the firing pin. So it's not going to anything, but it sure does come forward exactly the same way that it would <laughs> if you were shooting. So it's yeah. a little bit like, oh. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a very clever design. It, you mentioned the the ease down one. So if you have like a SIG 226 or a SIG 220 or a P230, you engage the decocker at the bottom of its stroke, and then there's like tension back on your finger. Right. And then you can slowly ease it up, or you can just sweep it out of the way, mm. and it goes forward. Um, like I said, this thing, and I actually misspoke. It's it's not a barrier so much as it is a drum that's repositioning that has a firing pin. I don't know what we'll call it. Uh, like another little hammer in there that then hits the firing pin that allows it to go forward. So that, that sweeps out of the way. Um, and there's nothing for the hammer to hit. It's it's the middleman. Yeah, you get the, the middleman out of the middle way. Man. <laughs> yeah, uh, super cool pistols and i think one they're super ergonomic two they're actually quite affordable so these are like mill serp now and you can yeah you can get these things for pretty damn reasonable prices really? yeah um they're the lowest i've seen them sell and this is maybe this is like pre pre uh covid phenomenon pricing it's like 399 bucks mm. and how it's clapped a, out was it not bad I mean, it looked like it had lived its life in a holster, which most of them do. Yeah. It's like when I used to buy police trade-ins at the gun shop. Oh, yeah. Those guns got shot like once, maybe twice a year, but they rode around in a duty mm-hmm. holster. They had like buckle wear on yeah. them, but they're still functional pistols. Um, and that's, that's very reasonable. A new 92 doesn't cost obscenely more. You know, I think they're probably in the $600 range for a, a base model. Mm-hmm. When you get into the more, uh, like, feature-rich versions where we get into the tactical-style stuff or the optics-ready stuff, certainly the price goes up a little bit. Um, so they're affordable, they're accessible, they're ergonomic. I love the way they feel in the hand. Mm-hmm. They, they have a, somewhat of a beaver tail on the back. You're not going to get a hammer bite. It causes or forces you to index properly on the pistol. You're getting up high enough on it. Um, that you have a, a good purchase on on the the hilt or the grip of the gun, um, a little bit better for people with big hands. I sure, will say. They, sure. They it, are, they are a bit uh, thick. With yeah. Two C's. It's a it's a substantial it's a substantial pistol. It Ryan's feels right. Would you say that they are known to be accurate? They shoot good. Yeah. So I was reading about that, but then also. I wonder where some of that accuracy is coming from if it is because it's a little bit heavier gun, if it is because of uh, the beaver tail and the indexing and things of that nature that it's not necessarily that the gun is more accurate, but people are shooting them more accurately. Does that make sense? That's That was my hypothesis as we've been going through kind of the feature set uh, and design of this pistol. I would say that that is a good hypothesis. But I also think Glocks shoot very, very well. Mm-hmm. So nothing, or a Smith & Wesson M&P. Or right. Like, I would say that the majority of pistols available to the consumer on the marketplace now will shoot better than most folks, myself included, can shoot the pistol. That is, if we were to I put agree. one in a ransom rest yeah, and we were to shoot it, you'd be like, wow, that thing cuts like one ragged hole at 25 yards. Um, I can't shoot a pistol that good. So I've always found M9s, 92s, whatever, uh, shoot quite well. And I think your theory is correct. It's a it's a very um, lenient or forgiving pistol to shoot. Ergo, you will shoot it better. It's like my, my P230 shot very well. If I was like on a sandbag and like really uh-huh. leaning into it, bag of sand and bam, like a shooting bag it. Of sand. <laughs> bag of sand, come on, man. <laughs> and I was... I was trying to like lean into it. I could shoot it very well, but it was very snappy. And so if I were to like put it up against like a Glock 26, which is a similar size pistol, but in a more ferocious caliber, the mighty nine millimeter, um, I generally shoot my 26 better because I don't think it beat me up so much. Hmm. But it's neither here nor there. Yeah, a gun that you uh, enjoy shooting and then therefore shoot more, generally you will shoot better. Yes. 
This is funny true. Funny how that works. Um, so what we've been talking about this whole time is the old bull, or at least the one you've been referencing. Mm-hmm. I got one more thing. Uh, yeah. This pistol is kind of part, they call it the Wonder 9 era. Like having to deal with like the magazine. Was it, was it like an early adopter? Or high cap. Of high cap. Like, yeah. Is it a double stack then? Yep. It is. Yep. Was it like one of the first double stacks then? Um, I'd have to look back on that. I would say no. But it was, for a pistol of that era, expanded capacity. Okay. So 15, like 15 rounds another, in another pistol in that class would be like a Smith & Wesson 59 series. Okay. Um, or there's a handful of other single stack semi-autos that came out because we're not far from 1911. Mm-hmm. At that point in time, in fact, this is the pistol that replaced the 1911 as a standard issue service pistol. Right. So the single stack format was common, um, and this is a double, and certainly doubles existed, and <coughs> other companies were quick to adopt or marry up that magazine capacity. Um, so yeah, you, you get a lot of you get a lot of rounds in the magazine, and you should because it has a full size frame, mm-hmm. full width frame. It can it can ha- handle that capacity. It looks like 15 in that. Correct. I could see how some people's complaints, if there were, uh, if there were any that were less, um, oh, that were actually based on like fact that you see and experience. You know, some people who say like, I get maybe some people have had legitimate reliability issues with them before or whatever it is. Uh, but then a lot of people hear that and then they say, oh, well, I don't like this because it has reliability issues. And it's like, well, have you experienced them? And they're like, well, no. And it's like, well, okay. But the thing that you can experience immediately is the size and weight of these. Mm-hmm. And so now we live in a funny time because there are people who are literally trying to make their guns heavier now. Yeah. Usually they're doing that for competition. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're a service member of some sort or if you're trying to carry this for self-defense purposes, then, yeah, I could see how it is a bit big and heavy to be wearing all day. And then when we talk about magazine capacity, it's like, all right, so I'm, I have a big heavy gun. A Glock mm-hmm. 17 is lighter weight and just as big. But it carries even more rounds yet mm-hmm. than, than this gun does. Uh, so that could be one knock against it sure i i concede to that um it's a full it's a full size gun yeah like right for for me once you once you approach that like the expectation should be the gun's kind of chunky it's a little thick i suppose right yeah i mean it's just like if i carried my glock 17 be a full size gun like oh well, yeah my anticipation is that i gotta tighten my belt a notch because it Weighs more. It's like buying it a does. truck and being like, "Well, this doesn't drive that great in the city." Correct. You know, doesn't correct. Fit yes, the, doesn't fit in the compact parking spots. Correct. That yes. is correct. You're expect- but if you're also somebody who who needs that service uh, pistol, the full size service pistol, and you're carrying it around all day, and Glocks and other polymer frame pistols are as good as they are, you know, it's like, well, why not save a couple of ounces sure. or more and carry potentially two more or more rounds? Yes. You know, I could see. I'm just trying to get at, like, all right, are are there legitimate gripes gripes against this thing yeah. that you can put into numbers and all that? And I think yes. Does that stop me from thinking this is a super sweet pistol, though? No, right. And I mean, the one that Brennan has here that we'll that we'll get into. This is a Langdon Tactical variant. Now, Brennan bought this for the sake of, uh, for the sake of, I believe, shooting in competition. Um. Now, he has a, a very cool tactical light on the bottom of it, so mm-hmm. maybe he's also carrying it in some form or fashion mm-hmm. as well. Uh, that could be also because he bought it originally for the intention of some sort of competition that he liked it so darn much that sure. he started wanting to carry it. I don't know, but that does, like, guns like this, I think, get marketed a lot that way, like, oh, hey, great competition gun or, mm-hmm. you know, range gun or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um But they do feel nice. Oh. And this, uh, this newer variant here, this Langdon one... Um, it's pretty cool. Oh, it's very sharp. Do you know a lot about what goes into these other than just the fact that, uh, you know, the, it's the usual, like, hey, we polished everything, we made everything really nice, and it's basically just kind of like uh, OEM plus in a lot of ways? That's a good way to describe it. Um, I'd be curious to chat with those guys. 
now that the new Berettas are coming out with most of the exact same features mm-hmm. as this hmm. right away. So sure, new grip panels, uh, kind of a flared ish magwell on the bottom, optics ready, rail ready, so that you can put a light on it. Mm-hmm. And like you'll notice, this one has a plate that is also acting as a rear sight. Yes, so which, you don't lose the rear sight. Oh, correct, sure, which mm-hmm. is super clever. Um, you know, does does the new Beretta displace this? Is the treatments done to the system on the Langdon? Uh, better, worse, or otherwise than what would otherwise be a box stock gun. I can only speculate. I I don't actually know. I this model doesn't have a safety. It's decocker only. Oh, I don't know if you noticed. that. I didn't. So yeah, when you sweep down uh, what would be the decocker and safety on the M ninety two, it doesn't stay down. Like oh, it can't stay rebounds. down. Rebounds. It just oh. yeah it rebounds. So uh, yeah. no matter what. You are either in double action or single sure, action. Sure. And so basically your safe, if you will, is is the double action trigger pull, which is actually much more in that sense like a revolver even still. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that'll speak to my ignorance on the Langdons. Uh, interesting gun where they were fixing a lot of the issues that people had with Berettas, at least from the modern sense or standpoint. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So they were... More or less unchanged since the you know mid to late seventies, Langdon brings them into a commercially available modern rig. Twenty first century, yeah. M ninety two slash M nine. Yes, they're very cool. They are very classic. Brennan says it shoots phenomenal. The trigger is very, 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 very nice. And I don't even mind the standard trigger, like from a no. I'm a guy. No, not at all. I've got a couple of J frames. Um, they're atrocious. You know they're. <laughs> You've got a J frame. Uh, the, I do, and you, I love it. Yeah, you got you got to lean in. You got to want that double action trigger pull and the single action. They're great. They're like a target rifle, but uh, uh, you know, a thirty eight snub nose revolver that's like this big. I'm not necessarily yeah. that keen on. My three fifty seven. As I'm pulling the trigger, I can actually feel like the tendons in my wrist, like strengthen. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a training aid and a viable defense tool. Indeed. You know, we don't give revolvers enough love. Boy, we sure don't. I know it. Do we not? No. That used to be the thing. You want what? a reliable gun, you get a revolver. Yeah, which I don't know if that's necessarily... I don't, I don't think it's true. It's not as foolproof I mean, as they're reliable. Out, oh, certainly. I mean... They're not unreliable, but they're right. not... I wouldn't call them more reliable. Right. There's a test that we can do. Uh, uh, but I don't... Uh, Cross-check. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind the double action pull on the... The standard 92. It just no. Not. All the guys down at the range are getting into the DSA gun. Sure. They're not stacky. They're not hinky. They're smooth all the way through. It feels about like the same pull weight. What is that little thing that's sticking up in front of the rear sight as you pull the trigger? Uh, it's part of, it's a, if I recall this correctly, is it a, a firing pin block? So it only, like right now, I can't slip off the trigger and fire it. Right? Oh. So you watch. Let me bring the hammer back down. So it does not actuate until you get to the very end of the pull right there. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's coming up. And then when it's all the way up, the firing pin block is gone and then it will go. Got it. So yeah, that makes sense. You wouldn't be able to slip but off. But I can't pull it back and drop the hammer because you'll see the hammer doesn't go all the way forward. Right, right. Yeah. So a safety mechanism yeah. so that yeah, if you slipped off during that uh, long double action trigger pull, you don't set one. Accidentally off. send one into the rhubarb. Very interesting. So that must all be happening underneath these optics plates when they put optics plates on. They must leave a recess for that Correct. to still occur. Yes, and that, that was probably that was, part, of, part of the machining and things yeah. we need to take into account. That is a considerably better double action on this one. Yeah, it's shorter and half the weight. Yes. That's nice. Oh, let me that's, see that. Thing. That's very oh, nice. Let me see the. Uh, Ryan has not put hands on this gun yet, um, un- until right now. I just brought it up. It's um. It's better nifty. than a lot of my Glocks out of the box. It's nifty, and that's in double action. Yeah. And the single action is reminiscent of my very nice nine millimeter nineteen eleven. A little spongier, but very very light. That's cool. It's a neat gun. Yeah. 
I think everybody should have an M9 or variant. I should. It, it was actually the first gun that I ever shot. I was about 10 years old. And my brother, I actually don't know if that's exactly how old he was, but I know that my brother was uh, joining the military and he got one. Yep. I think he got it because he was like, oh, this is what they're going to issue me, so I'm going to just check it out. And then we went down to visit him one time and I, they, they like put this in my hands as like a 10 year old. And it was kind of like, all right, just uh, point it that direction. And it felt very cool yeah. at the time. And they are cool. When you hold one, Mel Gibson comes to mind. Yeah. When you hold one, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, we were talking about Glocks. Are they the perfect pistol? The answer is still yes. Um, but? There are a couple of Berettas that are hard to come by that now have, because talk, of because of their age this. and their time, um, they made the 92C, which was a compact version of this. Yes. Uh, so think... Slightly shorter in the slide and ever so slightly shorter in the grip. Okay. Very, very clean lines, little pistol, adorable, adorable gun. Um, I just, I forgot about the pistol for a long time because every so often I have them come through the shop and be like, oh, 92C, that's cool. Went on Gun Broker, they're going for a sum of money. Hmm. More so than I ever sold one for. You can get one from these uh, landing guys. Yeah. Or, maybe, or probably their variant of it. A um, couple other neat options were like the Brigadier. I remember a couple of those coming through there. They had a little bit different grip profile. They were more straight. So this uh, kind of heel on the grip was mm-hmm. deleted, and the flare at the bottom was abbreviated slightly. They had a, a very different feel to them. I remember when those came out, they, they were neat. Um, when the first rail guns came out, I remember those two. That was cool. You could put your Surefire on the bottom of it or your Streamlight if, if you like those two, and... Um, then there's like the cheetah, which is a different version of this. There's the Tomcat, which is, it looks like it, it's not the same gun. And then there's the Bobcat. Mm? The Bobcat. Yeah. 21 Bobcat, 32 Tomcat. What, what are, what, what's the Bobcat and the Tomcat? Or the, the, what are the cats? 22. Oh. 25, 32, 380, 9, 40. That's cool. Yeah. I carried a thirty thirty two Tomcat for a period of time. Did you? Very short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> it had crimson, crimson Trace laser grips on it. It was the Inox model, oh. so it was all stainless. Oh, yeah. I felt like a real sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you did. Um, and then it uh, it wasn't what I was looking for in a pistol. It wasn't? No, because they're you pretty- You play enough poker. They're pretty much to this need one big. Of those. Yeah. When you when you like cut the grip off, cut the barrel off, they're a chunk monster. I mean, they are a chungus humongous, and um, it was a neat, it was a neat gun, it was super cool. Uh, the twenty ones barrels tip up, super hmm. super cool. Hmm. It's it's kind of funny to me. Like we were talking about how this came out in uh, you know what was it like mid seventies yeah. something like that. You know, adopted in the military mid eighties. Been around for a long time, mm-hmm. has grown to be an icon. Mm-hmm. It has a silhouette that many people are familiar with. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And um, it's kind of funny, though, how pistol technology and uh, the models that were out there um, changed a lot. Like, I'm kind of going through in my head, and I'm trying to just figure out. Sometimes it's, this is just fun, uh, even if you, you're not even right, but it's just to surmise what happened. But, like... The M16, when it came out, people not so sure about it. Sure. You know, was it the magazines? Was it the ammo? Was it how people were using it? Was it the jungles of Vietnam? I don't know. But, like, people not so sure about it. It went through iteration after iteration, and I would say that finally, in the last, I don't know, decade or so, and of course there were probably people who are well on board with the uh, M16 and M4 and all of its variants, AR-15, before then, but within the last decade or so, I'd say that people have finally gotten to the point where they're like, oh, wait, no, this thing is super legit, yeah. very reliable, very accurate, extremely modular. You really, on a technical level, outside of just enthusiasm and all these other things that might be a little bit better at one specific thing, you don't need anything else other than AR Correct. for pretty much everything on the planet. Correct. And um, didn't happen with the old M9. 
And no. I think, you know, the polymer frame guns came out, which there was never really anything that came out after the M16 slash M4 slash AR platform that, like, revolutionized and super upturned that platform like polymer frame handguns sure. to this. Sure. And maybe it takes time. Um, you know what, though? No, you're right. But because is, the, is the poly frame handgun the M16 of pistols? Like, is the original Glock... I mean, it might the be because it got, that got pistols. poo-hooed when it first came out, right. too. Yeah. I mean, it seems like almost anything that's new when it comes out it gets poo-hooed. That's true. And there's I been had... some there's been some valiant attempts to replace M4, M16 platform. Yes. Most of which have faltered out of the gate. Yeah. Whether that's a logistics thing, like we have a ton of them, mm-hmm. and so it's just probably the juice isn't worth the squeeze so to speak oh yeah because there's been some really cool ones where you're like oh yeah how did that not yeah it's cool robinson. but yeah then you're oh, yeah, <laughs> the old robinson let's let's not forget lest we forget <laughs> yeah. but then part of sometimes what you do with those things like you said is you look at them and you're like well none of my parts that i already have Correct. work with it you know Correct. so it's like its own little weird unique proprietary thing um but yeah i don't know i mean it's just it's unfortunate for the m9 in some ways where like it it it, I think, had not so many people now gone over to the polymer side, I think people would have now probably finally realized it's actually pretty darn good. We're seeing that pendulum swing. You think so? I do, because I was down at the range the other day getting ready for a class, and um, our very own Peter walked in with his USPSA gun. His CZ Shadow. A Charlie Zulu. And I was shocked. Taken aback. Not because it's CZ's not a brilliant pistol, because it's one of the most brilliant pistols. I'd have figured he'd have been rocking a Glock. Pete is about as diehard Glock of, of a Glock guy as I've run into, yeah. other than you and, and a handful of other people. Uh, you know who's a big Glock guy? Trenton Brenny. He's probably listening. That's- Huge Glock guy. Anyway, up, <laughs> he is a huge Glock guy. Actually, you're big, right. He's got a quite a collection. Big Glock he? guy. Um, does not like CZs or Berettas, I don't think. But <laughs> Peter had uh, a CZ, and I just I begged the question. I was like, Pete, a CZ? And he's like, man, I'm telling you, they are sweet. And if you look at like USPSA um, as a, a, a good barometer for what is a really nice pistol to shoot, a lot of CZ-75s, Tanfoglio's. 2011s. This is true. Full frame, heavyweight, very luxe pistols. This is true. Um, and if you look at the rigors of a lot of those competitions, the round counts that those guys are putting through those guns, the threshold of insanity that they're running them in, gosh, it makes a compelling argument to make a full-sized, heavyweight, full metal pistol your everyday carry. Why doesn't it translate? <sighs> Yeah, I just, I don't know. Because, yeah, when you talk about USPSA shooting, especially that, and you talk, you know, a lot of those guys, you'd be like, well, hey, can I shoot my Glock 17 in it? And a lot of times, I mean, yeah, like you technically can, but, and they're mm-hmm. they're trying to push you in. Like, you're going to like it so much more, yada, yada, yada. And all those same guys, say, they also preach, which I agree with, the fact that, hey, shooting USPSA isn't going to get you killed in the streets. It'll only make you a better shooter. It'll only make you better, you know, in self-defense scenarios, home defense scenarios, whatever it is. It's only going to make you better, better, better. But then, yeah, they're like, okay, but this Glock, I don't really love to shoot in USPSA. I want to get some Lux metal frame gun. But then as soon as they're not in USPSA, they're like, oh, I wouldn't carry that metal frame gun. I would carry my Palmer frame. <laughs> Isn't it silly? <laughs> it is funny. I, I don't get it. I mean, again, I don't know if it's the weight thing I mean, it's, if it's, or if it's a the, perception of the I don't know. It's the right tool for the job. I don't think this is the wrong tool for any job. You certainly can. Yes. Right. Right. That's I, what I... I mean, it's it's the whole. I mean, it's the same thing. Like guys, oh, I'm target archery. I'm gonna get a target bow. It's not my hunting bow. But I, they shoot better with that bow because it's their target bow, right? right? It has things on it that help them shoot better, right? And but so it's then you not ask necessarily the entirely practical, entirely because, like you said, you can, you, right. you people can and do carry these pistols. That's a but, little bit. That's a further cry from 
like if Brennan's using this for carry optics division, I have to imagine he's carrying this based on his holster. Correct. This would be an outstanding carry pistol. It's big, like it's got a surefire. I'm just saying it's probably it. it might be a little chunkier than what <laughs> some people would be interested just, in. You know, carrying like appendix or something like that. Sure. Most of those guys carry a full size gun. Mark, what do you uh, carry appendix? My appendix. <laughs> you still got one? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, actually. I also... Still doing whatever appendices do. Uh, vestigial organ. Nothing. Except get inflamed and try to kill you. I mean, you can't tell me it doesn't do anything. It's got to do something. But it's just a little dangler there. Still got it, though. Yeah. Still, mine, too. Um... I just think it's funny. I know that's kind of a tangent, but, um, but it, it's a re- it's it's a related tangent yeah, to yeah. the topic at hand. Um, I do I see. Know. So I would, uh, if okay, if it was me, right? Which I don't shoot well, any USPSA. Not yet. Right? Not yet. But I definitely, if I was shooting a gun like that, and that was. My competition gun is the gun that I run. I'm familiar with it. I shoot it all the time. I shoot it well. I practice with it. Uh, I like shooting it. I would be inclined to carry it because I'm doing those things. Mm -hmm. Just like if I was going to, and it probably wouldn't be like a popular choice, but like my old Glock 19 that I've had forever, if that's the gun that I wanted to carry, then that's what I would do USPSA with. But not because I wouldn't be doing USPSA to be good at USPSA though. I'd be doing USPSA to be proficient with my carry gun, if that makes sense. I'm I'm tracking. Yeah. It's like if I was going to go do target archery. archery, I would use my hunting bow because I actually care about hunting more. I'd just be doing the target archery for practice. Tracking. I know what you mean. A lot of the guys who are in USPSA often go into it, I think, with that idea, but then they get caught up in the competition of it. Sure. They get very competitive with themselves and one another. Right. And then they have to get better. And then they have to do better. But then it's funny that in order to do better, they usually wind up getting a different gun. Yeah. Which right. usually is one of these <laughs> kind right. of types of firearm. Correct. First, first guy I ever saw shoot one of these like very seriously in competition was my buddy TK. And I remember... I looked at the video, I was like, is that a Beretta? <laughs> and I called him like on the spot. I'm like, yeah. are you shooting a Beretta? And he's like, oh man, I'm telling you, <laughs> that thing's unbelievable. <laughs> and and I still think he shoots one today. Yeah. A Beretta. Unbelievable. Trade-offs. That's that's what it is. It's trade-offs. Uh, it's yeah, different sure. trade-offs for competition versus self-defense. But, it, but like... It is funny because a lot of people say that there shouldn't be a difference. I, yeah. Myself included. Which, which somebody is going to be in the comments like, ah, that's all I'll hear. Even if they actually write words, it's all, all I'll hear is, ah. Thankfully, but, I, I don't shoot that wretched sport anymore because I was really bad at it. It's just, oh, doubtful. Ryan. I was not a good pistol shooter, Mark. Still, I've I'm seen not. you shoot a pistol. You know what would make you a Very better pistol adept. shooter, Ryan? Shooting pistols. With a red dot. Possibly. Come to a freaking class, dude. I, I, hey. We, it's right here. It's across the parking lot. I'll check my schedule. Check his schedule. Step into the light. Mark shoots a USPSA match. I will shoot. Mark will do it. He'll do that. What else do you want him to do? Mark and I may have crossed paths at a three gun long before I knew Mark. <laughs> so That's, true. And it, I believe it was Superstition Mountain Mystery Three Gun in Arizona. Yeah. What were you doing there? That was the, uh, I th- we were that 13? Fi- shooting a video because we were going to introduce the uh, Razor 1 to 6. Oh, yep. got it. I was there. We're Jerry there. must have been there or Jerry, something. Jerry was there. Yeah. There was a helicopter yes. stage. Yes. That's where I lost my hearing. In the in the chopper. In the, hel- in the chopper. I lost my ear pro. I just it was in And a, you just went with it. No, no, no. Send. I've often wondered, like I feel at some point, and sometimes I'll avoid these things too. I may have avoided it because like I didn't shoot the match. You know, like yeah. I wasn't shooting, so I didn't feel like a you know, a participant. I feel like there might be a group photo from that match somewhere though. Like a like a big one with a lot of folks, and then I would just wonder, like, what if I was standing by Ryan? So That'd be amazing. I remember the photo, I think. I think it happened. That could be the power of suggestion. 
I'm going to tell the story though. I misplaced my ear pro in a pocket in my range bag. Yeah. Couldn't find it. I was yeah. on deck. Yeah, you know, it's probably Jack John doing God knows what, getting ready. Maybe and we were talking. That could be. <laughs> and I couldn't find my ear pro, and somebody tossed me a set of corded foamies. Yeah. And so I usually rip the cords out. Now I rip the cords out because of this. And I quick like threw them over my head and rolled them up, stuffed them in there. And if you remember that stage, you had to sit on a jump seat in the helicopter with your muzzle down right. and your stock up. And then at the start, you could pick up your gun and you couldn't charge it until you got, I think, to the bottom or onto the ramp off of the chopper. And in doing something, I like grabbed my gun in such a way that I hooked my cordage and it yanked my earplug out of my ear. <laughs> I charged that weapon. And I said, we'll be fine. Confidence of youth. And the first shot out of that gun sounded like, like when you scratch a record. Just, and then every subsequent shot, and that was a high round count stage with a rifle. And then it was a high round count with a pistol. It sounded like change dropping on the floor. Just, oh my God. Just yeah. absolutely muffled. Just, oh, 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 and I did oh. the whole thing, ate the whole thing, whole bowl. And uh, the, guy, the guy at the end, he's like, oh, he's like, are you all right? I'm like, no, my ear pro came out. He's like, why didn't you stop me? I'm like, I don't think I could. He's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. That's why I can't hear anything out of my left ear. Wow. Yeah. Gosh, I want to feel bad it for was you. It awesome. But I don't. It was why awesome. Why don't you feel bad for I walked what do you around. Mean? Because he was. Yeah, I, just I walked don't. around Phoenix with my ear plug in for two more days. And like people were looking at me like I was some sort of sideshow because I had one ear plug in. I was like, oh, you don't it understand. Is holding my, all your brains in. My tympanic membrane is completely ruptured right now and is in a state of leakage and seepage. And it hurts so bad at the yeah. slightest sound. Good um, never, never, never got that back. Um, so yeah, that was at the match you were at. I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. I've I've gotten over it now. And it's kind of a badge of honor. Oh yeah, no, I can't hear. <laughs> huh? Um. Anyway, back on on uh, the M9, M92, 96, any of those variants, iconic pistol, as yep. we've covered, um, should be held in similar regards as the 1911. Um, and I think offers, compared to a bone stock GI 1911 circa 1941, it's a more shootable pistol. It's it's an easier gun to get behind. Oh, the pitchforks. You don't get hammer bite from it. It's just such a smooth Ooh. operator. Who hates 1911s now? Hey, I've got them. Um, I do too. Really, really nice guns. Really nice guns. Joy to shoot. Magazines everywhere. They, this this one even says government use only, and, and it's got the restrictor plate in it, right there. Well, I mean, this is this is Damon's. He's can, that's going to be his. Uh, I borrowed this from him. Yeah, and that's what he's taking. Uh, he's going to be archery elk hunting. Yep, but that's his grizz medicine. That'll you know that'll be a viable defensive tool, and and that they are. I like that they have a lanyard loop on the bottom of them. Watch. <laughs> Watch the comments fly about. I'm serious. Oh, oh, hold on. on that has a what a is nine. that? A restrictor plate. Yeah, in it's it? got. If you look at the uh, magazine, it's got a intentional press into the bottom of it right here. This oval. Why do they have that? I keep you from putting more than 15 rounds in it. Oh, this magazine can hold 18. That I it can, and you can put it in this gun. So check so this out. So I misspoke then about the Glock 17 being able to hold more rounds. Uh, depends on the magazine. So well, I mean, I'm talking with a flush. Mag. You got a slight protrusion. You got an ever mm. so slightly. I mean, millimeter. Yeah. yeah, big deal. Three more rounds. Wow. Yep. So the more rounds you got, the less aim it take. Um, still one of my favorite comments. So yeah, yes. I think I think if you're an aficionado of pistols, uh, significant to us as a country and a species, yeah, uh, an M9. And or variant ought to adorn your collection. I gotta get that tan one that they have. It's like fifty shades oh, of tan. That's pretty yeah. sweet. It's like yeah. the scar of pistols. It does. Yes. It is. Yes. That's a really good way to look at it because it's cool. Yeah. Um. But very nice guns. Very nice guns. I've had nothing but pleasant experiences shooting M9s in a couple of different. You know what? Talking about variants. 
There's a device that you can get. Oh, yes. You know it's a good gun, and it has a lot of history when there's devices for well, it. So, important to point out, but accessories abound. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Going into your devices. Yes. But. There's a device that will lock the slide that when you're running suppressed, reverts it to a manual function only so that you increase the effectiveness of the suppression. Wow. So it's, and then you manually cycle the pistol. Yes. So it's, it's like, like a, when I shoot subs. Is, it's like when I shoot subs out of my 1022. Correct. And I, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. There's a machine. That's some golden eye stuff right there. There's a machine pistol variant, which there are very few of. So you talk about like iconic weapon systems, system as a whole. Like Glock has the 18, right? Mm-hmm. Machine pistol. Beretta has the 93, yeah, which baby. is a machine pistol. And it's got a little fold down foregrip that nests. Oh, that's the coolest gun. Yes. It nests underneath the dust cover here. Folds down and it gives you something to hold on to, and it's a machine pistol variant. That's a cool gun. Um, which I think that is novel. I mean, it's it's pretty cool. There again, we have a system solution, which I think is important. Like, it wasn't wasn't haphazardly designed. It was something that there was a no. need for, and a design came out for. Your it. gun hasn't made it yet in history unless you have devices. Yeah, correct for it. And so when you look at and when, when you look at a ninety three versus a ninety two. Same, same. Just that 93's got this neat little hinge grabby. And it's... <laughs> I, like I think that. that's what they call it. Hinge grabby? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, so I think that's significant. There's not a lot of pistols that are that. And there's mm. not, you know. So, yeah, the suppressor uh, adapter device is cool. The 93 variant, which is a no-touch item here, um, is neat. Neato mosquito. Uh, Glock 18s are neat, too. Um I've never shot a 93. I've shot an 18. Hmm. Yeah. If you've got a 93 and you'd like me to shoot it, I'd be happy to. Just deleting mags. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Nito Mosquito, yeah, which is completely unrelated, but it made me think about that. That was, Wasn't that, that a Sig Mosquito? Their 22? Wasn't yeah. That what that was called? Yeah. Yep. Good little yeah, pistol. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. You said Mosquito. You know what else I want to say? we're talking about pistols. I right? want to yeah. say about the M9 and its... Um, you know, ubiquitousness or iconic nature is Beretta has released semi-automatic pistols different than the M9. And they've never, ever had the bite that the M9 does. So like the, that is coo- true. the Cougar, which is a very revolutionary gun, rotating barrel, very cool pistol. You look at it and you're like, eh. You, because of its history, because of its military adoption for so long, yeah, yeah. like I would be, it would be hard for me to be like, oh, I'm going to get a Beretta, but not an M9. Yeah, they, exactly. They've yeah. got some Palmer. You're frame almost like ones obligated. That are meh. yeah. So, like if you were going to get two, then you might be like, okay, now I'm going to branch out. Yeah. But hey, I got a question. When I say Beretta. Do you think, well, now, granted, we have all these uh, M9s on the table. Do you think of this first or shotguns first? first? thing I think of is shotguns. Me too. Okay, yeah. I just was curious. Because for a guy like me, it took me until a couple of years ago to even realize that they made shotguns sure. at all. Sure. Uh, but My first yeah, shotgun. I, was just, I actually thought that that was like the only thing that they made, the M9. I was this close. I was deciding between getting a Beretta and the Browning A500. And I got the Browning. Yeah, you of course you got the Browning. Beretta has been. I think that's you prob- love Browning, but that's probably dude. I was also like, I don't know, fourteen. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think my affinity for Brown oh. like that probably started. Sure, my affinity for okay. Brownings, but uh, Beretta's been making guns since the fifteen hundreds. Yeah, that needs to be acknowledged. It does. Mm. They've been around for yeah. It. A minute. There's a little clout there. Yeah, and they know what they're doing. I mean, they they make some top tier stuff. And uh, what I love about them as a company is they have a solution like this. It's a really affordable thing. And if you want to buy a one million dollar gun, you could do it. Um, and it's awesome. Uh, more Olympians shoot their products um, than pretty much anything else for like Clay's guns, especially um, the military use this and still does in capacity uh, for many, many years, longer than I've been alive. And more people out there shooting 
everything from woodchucks to woodcock with their commercial products and everything in between. Cool stuff. They know what they're doing. Really nice pistols, really nice rifles, really nice shotguns. Neat. Let's end on that. 1500s. Yep. Bye, Beretta. Well, gentlemen, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this uh, podcast on a very, um, like you said, Ryan, just iconic, historic, cool firearm, some unique things about it. Uh, Definitely stands the test of time. Potentially, kind of, it appears like it's making a little bit of resurgence. What's up? You raised your hand. Uh, If we get Berettas, do we have to get jean jackets or leather jackets? I'm going jean. Okay. Um, Mine's going to be reversible. Oh. How do you like that? Oh, that's going to be hot. Uh, <laughs> might stop a bullet. I don't know. Um, it won't. So nobody take that advice. Uh, where was I? <laughs> do you have you an M9? The do you love the M9? And then Brian raised his hand. Uh, tell us about your M9. Yeah. Do you love it? Do you feel like more people should love it? Yeah. It's, or tell uh, us about the M9 before the boat accident. Hmm. Yeah, that's you know true I mean? too. Wait, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. See you. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.